So welcome back, everybody. Hope we're all ready for the next session. Um, so after hearing from Sam Roscoe on supply chain logics, we have another session that deals with value chain, uh, although from a different perspective. Uh, in this session, we have a paper titled Ensuring More Inclusive Trade, the Case of Labor Standards in the Global Garment Supply Chain in Times of COVID-19. This work is by Samantha Velluti, she is reader in law at Sussex Law School and a member of the Sussex European Institute. She has researched extensively in EU law and policy, European governance issues, EU asylum law, and EU's approach to human rights conditionality in its relations with third countries. So without adding much further, I will give the floor to Samantha for her talk. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just getting the slides ready. Okay, well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak uh, today at such an interesting uh, conference, which uh, has provided much food for thought. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to be given the opportunity to present some very preliminary work about the important issue of garment workers' rights and labor standards in global supply chains and what we can and uh, should do amid renewed calls of a more inclusive society and trade processes, operations and uh, relations. Now, as we know, an increasing number of goods and commodities are made by uh, a global workforce fragmented across a plurality of uh, national boundaries, work sites and uh, employers. Transnational retail companies arrange and control large amounts of global production across these complex multinational networks. And the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development has estimated that they cover about 80% of global trade. These retail giants uh, that are at the top of this complex web source products through uh, commercial contracts across hundreds, if not thousands of suppliers each uh, of which is a legal entity in its own uh, right, employing its own workers. And this allows products to be made cheaply and uh, quickly, uh, but it also averts any legal responsibility of transnational uh, corporations for abusive labor uh, practices that are associated uh, with their production. So while uh, multinational enterprises dominate the global market and uh, create and impose market rules, they bear little responsibility for their negative impact. And uh, global supply chains therefore allow big brands to make vast amounts of uh, profit and accumulate historical le historic levels of wealth. Uh, but as suppliers struggle to get goods to them on time and for low costs, and particularly as we've seen during the pandemic, workers are often left underpaid and uh, unprotected. Uh, reports about the abusive conditions in uh, Cambodia's garment factories, which make uh, clothes for well-known brands such as uh, Marks and Spencer's, The Gap and Adidas, continue to focus the world's attention on the dangers of global supply chains um, for workers. And uh, disasters such as the uh, very well reported uh, Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, and equally reports of alleged forced labor and uh, modern slavery here in the UK, see the case of Buhu and working conditions of the workers of its suppliers in Leicester, which is the UK's largest garment uh, factory hub, question the viability of the current structure of global supply chains from a labor rights perspective, and whether they can ever actually ensure uh, workers' safety and uh, social justice. In fact, there is evidence that shows unauthorized subcontracting under a non-payment uh, of wages, excessive and involuntary uh, overtime, or the use of exploited underage or illegal uh, labor. And suppliers often claim that they have no alternative uh, if they are to stay uh, in business. And so the consequence of this is that workers are in a perpetual state of uh, structural disempowerment with little recourse in terms of legal action and judicial remedies against uh, 
um, transnational corporations whose products they are uh, producing, since legal liability for labor standards is fractured uh, across suppliers and intermediaries. And so the paper is situated within this debate about global labor governance, focusing in particular on the EU policy and uh, legal uh, framework. And I, uh, as I uh, show here on the slide, the paper starts by looking at uh, the EU external trade policy uh, framework and the interplay between interests and uh, values uh, post-Lisbon, that is uh, the Treaty of Lisbon. Uh, and then I move on to look at the fragmented international legal uh, and regulatory framework of labour governance, looking at some first findings uh, of the impact of uh, COVID-19 on workers. And I conclude by sketching uh, what is an EU-wide global supply chain regime by looking uh, at some recent developments at EU level uh, and also uh, by um, briefly looking at some national legislation in Europe which uh, has already uh, been uh, considering due diligence, corporate due diligence. Um, so, uh, as I said, the paper starts by tracing key developments uh, and stages in the external trade policy, which constitutes the overarching uh, framework in which the EU's promotion of international labour standards is located. Uh, and here, uh, when I refer to evolution, I'm not suggesting that it's been a linear process from a deep trade agenda to manage globalisation to inclusive trade, rather the emphasis here is on the interconnectedness between the components of this triad. And so in the interest of time, um, I won't go into uh, any particular detail, but uh, what I will say is that the EU has embraced a policy of so-called managed globalization, uh, which is a, a term first uh, coined by Pascal Lamy uh, when commissioner of DG um, Trade. Um, of the Commission. And central to these developments is the 2009 uh, Treaty of Lisbon, which has provided the legal foundation for embed embedding a managed globalization appro approach within the EU's deep trade agenda and more recently inclusive trade. Within its two constituting logics, uh, namely a push for further liberalization um, and at the same time the promotion of a rule of law approach entailing the strict observance of international law, sustainable development goals, and compliance with human rights, um, international labor standards, and decent uh, work. But the Treaty of Lisbon, while constitutionalizing these overarching goals and attempting their legal uh, systematization, has not been able to ensure overall coherence. And why is this relevant here? Well, because the lack of coherence, namely the inability to ensure consistency between trade and non-economic objectives leads to ineffective or partial implementation of policies and legal measures, making the EU um, a conflicted trade power. And so um, in this slide, I give an infographic of the complex web of networks that make up the uh, global garment production chain system to illustrate how the rise of transnational corporations has also led to new forms of investment and business uh, organization that have transformed the world uh, of work, such as licensing agreements, uh, joint ventures, subcontracting and offshoring. And the main concern is that there is a disjuncture between the legal frameworks governing trade relations, which are no longer um, underpinned by territorial principle of jurisdiction and labor uh, which to a large extent has not managed to free itself from national regulation. Hence, while markets have become global, decision-making authorities remain largely uh, national. And this is a major weakness of the international labor regulatory framework, which continues to place reliance on national labor laws at a time when there is widespread uh, deregulation. Now, the ILO is the UN agency entrusted with the promotion of internationally uh, recognized human and labor rights standards, and it is considered the most authoritative norm and standard setting uh, body at international level, as exemplified by its fundamental uh, core convention, uh, conventions enshrining core labor standards, which are listed here at the top left uh, hand corner. 
And it is worth mentioning for those of you not so familiar with them that all ILO members, even if they have not ratified the conventions in question, have an obligation to respect, promote and realize the fundamental rights or core labor standards which are protected in these conventions. Nevertheless, the ILO lacks effective enforcement mechanisms as it cannot impose sanctions on states due to the international law principle of non-intervention that restricts the interference with internal affairs of uh, nations uh, combined with the influence exerted by states and increasingly multinational enterprises uh, on international institutions to pursue their own self-interests. In addition, there is a tripartite declaration of principles uh, concerning multinational enterprises and social policy, also known as the ILO MNE Declaration, which is the key ILO instrument that provides direct guidance to enterprises um, to uh, basically act, operate responsibly and sustainably. However, to date, it has only had limited effects. And we should also mention the uh, UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, uh, more commonly known as uh, the RUGI Principles, which provide an international standard for preventing and addressing the risk of adverse human rights impact of business activity. And significantly, these principles are anchored to the core uh, ILO uh, conventions. Um, we also have the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, which are government led and they're essentially recommendations uh, addressed to multinational enterprises. And again, they provide non-binding uh, principles and standards for responsible business conduct. And what is interesting is that on the OECD uh, website, responsible business conduct is being defined as the new normal uh, for a sustainable future. However, these initiatives are all beset by the same limitation, namely that they rely on private self-regulation and corporate social responsibility mechanisms, such as codes of conduct, which are not sufficiently effective on their own to ensure adequate uh, labour standards in global supply chains. And the paper goes at great length to explain why. And so the main argument put forward here is that um, they need to be sustained and buttressed by legally binding measures adopted by public institutions at both international and national levels. And as I say here, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has aggravated existing trends. So um, large retailers, um, namely global buyers, have exerted even more pressure on producers and suppliers to provide lower prices to consumers. For example, in Bangladesh, half of the garment, uh, garment suppliers uh, lamented that they had the bulk of their in-process or already completed orders cancelled. And many retailers refused to pay for raw materials, such as fabric that the supplier had uh, already purchased. And these are decisive factors in the cutting of labour costs and deterioration of working conditions, which has also led to an intensification of COVID-19 outbreaks uh, among workers on top of uh, an increase of job uh, losses. And so um, the economic and health crisis caused by COVID-19 uh, and what it has revealed uh, of global supply chains worldwide has led to renewed calls for a rethink uh, of global supply chains in the garment industry uh, to ensure greater equality, inclusivity and sustainability. And in particular by um, uh, adopting legally, uh, a legally binding uh, regime for corporate due diligence to leverage existing private uh, regulatory initiatives, and also uh, to ensure some degree of corporate uh, responsibility, both at national and EU uh, level. So um, significantly, the commission just a, a year ago has uh, submitted a proposal for a directive on sustainable corporate governance that would also cover human rights and environmental uh, due diligence. And the EU Parliament has been particularly a strong advocate uh, of having binding legislation. Um, uh, stressing in particular the importance of uh, um, global supply uh, chains. 
Now, the EU global supply chain mandatory regime would build on existing legislation. And in particular, it has already been suggested that it could build on and strengthen existing corporate reporting requirements, such as those provided in the 2014 uh, Directive on the Disclosure of Non-Financial and Diversity Information uh, by certain large undertakings and groups, as well as using the timber regulation as a blueprint for developing uh, a system of uh, enforcement and sanctions for a mandatory cross-sectoral uh, system of due diligence. And the regulation, uh, in fact, also gives some concrete examples as to how this uh, can be done. Uh, and the proposed EU global supply chain regime would also build on voluntary initiatives to address uh, human rights and environmental standards that the EU has already uh, adopted. Um, it would also uh, be following due diligence laws that have already been adopted at national level. Uh, just to mention the, the key ones, the UK's Modern Slavery Act 2015, France's 2017 Duty of Vigilance Law, the Netherlands Child Labour Due Diligence Law, and more recently Germany's Act on Corporate Due Diligence in Supply Chains, which was adopted only a few months ago uh, this year. My view is that this binding EU legislation should be a regulation rather than a directive because it would reduce the margin of manoeuvre of the member states and reduce diversity in national legislation uh, and would also guarantee a better level, a level playing field. But the challenge, uh, of course, is the design. So uh, studies have already indicated, uh, in fact, that national legislation uh, is not uh, perfect and uh, Germany's final text of, of the Act on uh, Corporate Due Diligence is, uh, in fact, a um, diluted version of the original text, and many campaigners and activists uh, say that it is uh, too weak. And just to uh, conclude, uh, the other avenue that uh, I uh, suggest putting forward is injecting a due diligence mainstreaming approach in existing EU labour uh, legislation, thereby uh, recognizing its potential extraterritorial reach and uh, correlated extraterritorial human rights obligations of EU-based companies and employers, uh, particularly re retailers. And uh, I have a, a, a couple of examples. One is the Public Procurement uh, Directive, which already considers the possibility of using procurement to achieve both social and uh, individual uh, justice. Uh, specifically, it has uh, a requirement that at all stages of the procedure, there is now an obligation for member states and contracting authorities to comply with social and environmental uh, legislation and labour law and to combat excessively low uh, tenders. Then the other example would be the European Works Council Directive, um, which recognises the transnationalization. Uh, of undertakings and um, group of undertakings and provides for a legally enforceable duty uh, that uh, has the objective of improving consultation and, impro uh, and information uh, of uh, workers. And lastly, there's also the minimum wage directive. This is still a proposal. Uh, it has already caused a lot of debate, uh, but what, it is, what is interesting in the proposal of the commission is that there's explicit reference to low wage workers being affected by COVID-19. And so uh, the idea here would, could be that the EU legislator could go a step further and insert specific provisions in this proposed directive to impose positive obligations on member states to require uh, transnational corporations to observe uh, core labour standards. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samantha. This is... Um... Very, very relevant topics, a very interesting presentation. Thank you, which as you showed has become even more pressing now during the pandemic. So definitely um, you know, something needs to be done to address it. Um, so before I talk too much, I would like to give the floor to uh, the discussant. Um, discussion, the discussant for this session is James Harrison. He is professor in the School of Law at the University of Warwick. He is co-director of the Center for Human Rights in Practice. He's also one of the editors of Lacuna Magazine. Uh, James, I uh, hope you're here with us. Hello, can you hear yeah. me? Great, Hi. Yeah. Great. yes. Uh, so, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Uh, 
So can you can everyone hear me okay? Good. Yes. Okay. So thanks to the organizers for um, this really enjoyable conference and to Samantha for the paper, which I also really enjoyed uh, reading. Um, so diving straight into my comments on the paper, um, it's very good at evidencing the exploitation of workers in global supply chains, generally in the garment uh, industry specifically. It argues that cheap, fast fashion is leading to the exploitation of workers while at the same time being hugely environmentally damaging. Um, the paper also does very well to explain why existing approaches to dealing with this problem are deficient. So national labor law in many developing country contexts is inadequate while private self-regulation is not sufficiently effective on its own to ensure adequate labor standards in the garment sector. And even when reinforced by multi-stakeholder certification processes, these private regulatory efforts appear more concerned to quote Bob Heppel as Samantha does with legitimating sustainable capitalism rather than promoting sustainable social development in the world's poorest and most disadvantaged countries. And this seems like a, to me a reasonable conclusion to draw and is well evidenced in the literature, a great deal of which Samantha cites. Also, it seems to me to be well evidenced that the pandemic has worsened the situation in global supply chains in the garment industry, whereby lead firms have cut their losses at the expense of factories and workers in the rest of the supply chain. Um, and I came across an example of this very issue yesterday. I've been leading a project over the last year to investigate how grievance mechanisms work in multi-stakeholder initiatives. Uh, and a number of these mechanisms are in the garment sector. And I was looking at an interview conducted by one of my project team. And despite the grievance mechanism in question, uh, finding that the interviewee was one of 300 workers unfairly dismissed from a garment factory, for two years, no action had been taken to reinstate or compensate her. Then the pandemic hit and the factory staff were decreased from 1,250 to 250 workers. And in this context, there was no way that our complainant would ever be provided with an effective remedy. And this case is symptomatic of the problems faced by workers, the lack of effective remedies available when their rights are violated, and how the situation is exacerbated by the pandemic, as I think Samantha very well demonstrates. So moving on, the paper was also good at discussing the weaknesses of public international law when it comes to tackling these issues. The ILO lacks the power to address labor issues adequately and is very, very limited in terms of its efforts to directly engage with lead firms and their responsibility for their supply chains. The WTO is riven with conflict and does not look well placed to address these issues. And one suggested additional critique which could be explored a little more are the inadequacies of labor provisions in bilateral and regional trade agreements which have failed to meaningfully connect with issues of exploitation of workers in global supply chains. And again, there's now an extensive literature on this, which I know Samantha's contributed to, and we were discussing also in an earlier session. Um, some of this, my, some of my own work has been around Moldova and the, uh, its agreement with the EU and the effect of that on the garment trade, uh, trade which are where the EU-Moldova agreement has um, liberalized trade in a way that has greatly expanded the garment trade, but also expanded uh, exploitation of workers because of pressure from lead buyers in the UK and, the, and Italy and led to uh, increased practices of forced overtime and poverty wages. So this, you know, but at the same time, the labor provisions in that trade agreement just haven't engaged with those kind of supply chain issues. Um, so we have the problem of worker exploitation in supply chain generally and the garment chain specifically exacerbated by COVID. And we have the failure of regulatory responses in terms of national law and international private and public regulatory action. Um, so the suggestions I would make about streamlining some of the arguments in the paper to allow you to reach this conclusion a little more quickly and allow you to spend more time on the proposed solutions, but I think the main points are really well made. Um, what is needed, did you then argue, is stronger and legally, legally binding measures adopted by public institutions at both international and national levels. And again, I would agree with this, and the critical issue is then what type of legal obligations um, look best suited to addressing the problem. And you mentioned various directives um, and uh, uh, strengthen the ethical procurement processes so that member states and the EU are using their buying power to change corporate behavior. And these are good ideas, but I mentioned relatively briefly, and they could be expanded upon and the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches compared and contrasted, I think would be really useful. Um, but the main solution which I wanted to talk about here because it's dealt with in most depth in the paper, is to build on the human rights due diligence obligation enunciated by various UN bodies, that the UN, EU itself and its member states have a duty to ensure that all businesses domiciled in their territories respect human rights, 
uh, during their operations in third countries and they carry out investigations and set up legal redress mechanisms in relation to the harmful activities of the, such businesses operating abroad. So as you say, work is already aware, underway in various national jurisdictions and at the EU level to enact due diligence laws. The challenge is how to define, sorry, design an effective due diligence model. And you give some ideas about how this might be done basing on existing EU regulations, but it'd be good to have some more detailed examination of the potential and limitations of this mechanism. So at the heart of the due diligence process is the idea that a corporation reports on its own human rights, labor rights, performance, et cetera. How do we ensure that this is done and reported on in a meaningful way when self-reporting is so central? Could this become yet another uh, corporate greenwashing exercise? Uh, so other similar legal frameworks, I think you pointed out yourself that the German one doesn't seem um, optimal and the UK's Modern Slavery Act and the French Vigilance Law do not appear to be creating meaningful action reporting by companies at the moment. So my own view is that power relations in human rights due diligence processes and transparency of reporting are critical issues that have not yet been adequately addressed. And I could say this more about this in discussion if it's of interest. Um, in any case, there are big challenges here and it'd be good to hear more about how legislation should go about addressing them. Then we'll be in a better position to compare and contrast the due diligence model with other regulatory approaches to addressing abuse of workers in global supply chains. At the same time, given that focus of the paper is on the garment sector, it would be good to hear a little more about what due diligence might look like in that sector. And this might help us to make the case about the type of regulation that is needed to make due diligence work at a sectoral level. But overall, I, I really like the paper. It presents us with a, a really significant problem with our global trading system showed us as, shows us the inadequacies of current ways of addressing the problems and points to initiatives that give us hope for something better in the future. Well, thank you very much, James, for all. I mean, this, hopefully, Samantha will find your points very valuable. I mean, this is a uh, insightful discussion. Samantha, would you like to respond to James? Um, um, yes, I, I, I won't be able to touch on all of those points because this is work in progress, uh, but uh, I have noted them. Um, and I might address one or two um, in relation to the design, but uh, I wanted to go back to the um, uh, idea of including clauses in um, bilateral and regional trade agreements, because that's where I've carried out more research. Um, and yes, um, uh, discussed it also with, with James um, and other colleagues in the past. And, I mean, this is a sort of a, a million dollar question, uh, but my conclusion is, is quite negative. I mean, independently from sort of qualitative or quantitative analysis of, you know, the, the outcome, you know, whether we should or what happens when we insert uh, non-trade clauses in, in the agreements, purely from a very narrow sort of legal or if you want legalistic point of view, uh, the problem um, is, you know, if we see it from nationals of uh, third countries that sign agreements with, with the EU, uh, what is uh, particularly problematic is that um, they don't have legal standing to challenge these agreements. So um, in actual fact, what happens is that, you know, even though you, the EU is considered sort of like a sui generis, you know, um, international organizations, uh, organization with a unique legal system, when it gets to international agreements, the, the sort of standard rules of public international law apply, you know, thinking about material breach and so on. Uh, and so the relationship remains between the two parties and nationals uh, affected uh, by the agreement can't challenge these agreements. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've got, unfortunately, we've got very clear examples about this from the, um, the case law of the courts, uh, both the Court of Justice, you know, um, and the general court uh, have made it clear that they don't have standing. Um, just to mention, um, you know, a couple of uh, cases, uh, we could, you know, talk about Caddy forever, uh, but um, even more relevant here is the Commune de Champagne, uh, Champagne case, um, where the general court 
uh, basically excluded individuals in third countries from having the standing to challenge. Um, in this case, it was a unilateral act. Um, but what matters here is that the fact that the court said that doesn't have extraterritorial reach, you know, that, uh, and for that reason, um, citizens of third countries cannot um, challenge uh, the act in question. And there was also another case, again, the, the general court in the Mulgrabi case reached the same uh, conclusion. Um, and so um, I remain skeptical about, you know, uh, including clauses in these agreements, at least from, you know, the typical hard law, uh, narrow perspective. If we talk about uh, socialization and, you know, other processes to change the law, um, that might be uh, an avenue. But again, on a more negative note, um, the so-called new generation of free trade agreements uh, have explicit provisions that exclude uh, that uh, these agreements can have direct effect, i.e. that, again, um, that they confer rights or impose obligations um, that can directly be invoked uh, before the EU or before uh, national courts. So specifically in relation to uh, international agreements, I remain skeptical. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the challenge I think remains the, the design of this um, mandatory uh, legal framework, uh, because uh, even when we have um, laws like the French one, which impose uh, mandatory reporting systems or even uh, judicial remedies than the the evidence. I mean, these are new laws, so there's not much so far, but uh, the evidence seems to suggest that, again, um, they either target only you know, very big companies uh, or uh, you know, they, they don't report um, their activities properly. So, you know, there, there are uh, implementation uh, problems. So the challenge is, is really going to be the design and uh, and that will be the next step of, of my research. But thank you very much for your comments and you know I, I will use them to uh, improve the paper. Thank you, Samantha. I, I guess your uh, your answer probably partly addresses one of the questions that just came to the Q&A from Emily Litgate. She was asking you whether you could sort of expand a bit on the role of the courts in putting pressure on these multinational corporations. And she, she cites the example of a recent lawsuit from child laborers against major chocolate companies, which was dismissed by the US Supreme Court as the abuse that you know, happened outside the US. So I presume you, you, know, you, you want to expand a bit on this or you know, I presume your, your answer was already completely clear from before. Yes, well, I mean, I, I, I examined it particularly from uh, the perspective of the EU courts, which, you know, with some caution we can compare to the US Supreme Court. So uh, from, from that point of view, the avenue seems pretty slim uh, at, at the moment, because obviously, I mean, there are other issues tied in, uh, you know, non-substantive issues more to do with, say, you know, the, the autonomy of the EU legal order, which uh, the, the EU courts are always very, particularly the Court of Justice, not so much the General Court, but um, the EU Court of Justice is always very, concerned with preserving and that that's why sort of I started by looking at the overarching framework to explain how you know that conflicting goals of the EU and it's not quite clear what place the what place human rights have in the EU legal order despite all the rhetoric. Thank you. Um, all right we have another two three minutes for questions before we break uh, for 10 minutes. Um, if there's no other comments to the q and I will maybe just ask Samantha something. I mean, I, I found your um, idea of a EU-wide due diligence for GVC is interesting because the role of lead firm, lead firms in GVCs could often, you know, I think can often be as strong as that of um, public regulation in a certain area. So I wonder whether you could, you know, in your sort of experience or how do you feel the relative weight of private versus public regulation in actually making a difference um, you know, for instance, in the garment value chains? Uh, well, uh, I mean, what, what I suggest in the paper is not to completely reject private self-regulation, but to tie, in, tie it in with 
um, a regulatory framework which um, imposes some clear obligations. Uh, so both recommendations and uh, laws that you know together can provide a clearer framework. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm also in favour of establishing an EU regime is because uh, I mean something that I'd only that I've only touched upon tangentially uh, is because of the issue of extraterritoriality. So I mean I I mentioned before the problem of legal standing. Uh, that um, nationals of uh, countries outside of the EU have. Uh, but there's also a legal question of how can you impose uh, extraterritorial obligations. There's a lot of debate and a lot of disagreement as to whether that is possible. Um, also in relation to the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, you know, there's no agreement at the moment whether it has any extraterritorial effects, um, some judgments would seem to suggest that, but uh, again, there's a lot of um, scepticism um, in relation to whether we can use the EU Charter also because, again, there are other sort of legalistic problems as to uh, whether all of its provisions are, you know, contain the protection of uh, rights as opposed to principles, um, problems, again, of direct effect, um, and the court has not pronounced itself in relation to all the rights, you know, one example being the right to asylum, you know, the court, um, in spite of many requests by national courts, hasn't said whether or not it is a substantive right um, in its own right. So it, it's in the charter, but, you know, it hasn't really been used. Um, and lastly, there isn't a, an explicit provision like there is in the European Convention on Human Rights in relation to its jurisdiction and whether it's universal as such. So, um, so there are many sort of very technical problems uh, which, um, which explain why the focus should be internally. Um, and I have explored jurisdictional models that replace extraterritoriality. Um, just to mention one, uh, Joanne Scott's uh, notion of uh, territorial extension could be a possibility. Uh, because it would avoid a lot of the limitations that the notion of extraterritoriality has um, and because the focus would be on the EU rather than on actions outside uh, of the EU's borders. Uh, so there are solutions but um, there is no sort of a unanimous um, consensus uh, on, on these ideas. I see. I see. It's a bit of a grim picture, the one you paint. Um, the, there is another question, actually, from, from Alan Winters um, about um, sort of the, the role of developing country governments. Um, do, do you know, do you, is there evidence about whether they welcome or reject developed countries, courts or governments commenting on the rights of their workers? So you know, is this perceived as an interference or... Well, um, I don't have any hard evidence as such. I only have sort of anecdotal uh, information. Uh, I mean, not necessarily um, in relation to courts, but I, I've been looking, for example, at the negotiations between the EU and India uh, for a bilateral agreement between the two countries. And um, there's been a lot of resistance on the part of India to have human rights clauses or um, sustainable development um, clauses in the treaty with the EU uh, because, you know, again, going back to accusations of the EU being um, colonialist, sort of imposing, you know, uh, a new form of colonialism um, and, and also of protectionism um, towards its own uh, firms and, and companies. So there is resistance, uh, yes, I would say, but as I said, I I only have anecdotal, not sort of hard law uh, evidence. I haven't looked at it uh, in relation to uh, the decisions of the uh, EU courts. I think one of the, if I can step in and add just, I think one of the interesting things about the due diligence uh, movement is that it switches attention from that kind of country to country uh, relationship that we have in trade agreements traditionally. And it's about the supply chain and the obligations on the firm to cascade it down through their um, suppliers and through their supply chain directly to um, uh, other countries. And so you get around a bit of that kind of problems of the developing developed country 
um, dichotomy that we see in traditionally in these debates. So for all my reservations about due diligence, in some respect, I think there are advantages to it in trying to kind of weave these debates forward in other ways. Thank you, James. Um, all right. Th thanks both James and Samantha. That was a, I mean, a bit of a, a tough discussion, but um, that definitely some, you know, something we need to talk about. I think we need to bring this now to a close. We have overrun our time by a couple of minutes. Um, we have about eight minutes break now, and we will be back here at 20 past four for a round table on what does an inclusive trade policy mean and how to achieve it. And as Ingo mentioned already in the introduction um, to today's sessions, uh, we will have a host of excellent speakers. So make sure you don't miss that. In the meantime, uh, I guess you can find uh, speakers and attendees on Wonder for further discussion on this paper or just general catch up with colleagues and friends. See you in about seven minutes. <laughs>